Welcome, friends, enemies, and everyone in between, back to my channel, The Masked Mormon. I am, in fact, The Masked Mormon. Why are you wearing a mask? Were you burned by acid or something like that? Oh no, it's just they're terribly comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. I know it's been a little while since the last time I posted. It's been a pretty crazy last few weeks. And to be perfectly honest, I've been a little lazy, but at the same time, I've been um, thinking about what I wanted to share and kind of some of the things I want to do with this channel. I've uh, gotten to a year uh, doing The Masked Mormon, and I've been uh, wanting to see this channel grow. And so I've been kind of considering some things to do, maybe some things I can do differently, maybe post a little bit more. But uh, if you like what I do, please definitely uh, share, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff that you know, all the YouTubers <laughs> always try to, uh, uh, to do. Today's video, uh, I kind of wanted to go over a, a podcast I listened to uh, a while ago, and I really loved it. And the messaging of that podcast is right in, lo in line with what I do uh, here on The Masked Mormon. Uh, the podcast I listened to was uh, put out by John Larson quite a while ago on the Mormon Expressions podcast called How to Build a Trans-Oceanic Vessel. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that podcast, I recommend that you go and uh, definitely listen to it. It is uh, funny, it is smart, um, brings up a lot of good points, and I wanted to review some of those things and also maybe add in a few uh, thoughts on my own uh, to kind of help flush out uh, some of the things that uh, John, John Larson and the people in that podcast bring up. So the first thing I wanted to talk about are miracles. So there's a level one miracle, um, and that kind of miracle are things that are convenient. Uh, things that kind of um, uh, work to or, towards your favor. Somebody might uh, ascribe as luck or uh, just uh, fortune or karma or whatever the, uh, smiling down upon you. This would be kind of like the uh, God of the Lost Keys. Uh, I know a lot of times people joke about uh, Mormons talking about a miracle of uh, li finding keys that were lost or some other lost item. Uh, so this would be a level one miracle. A level two miracle are miracles that are possible, but very unlikely. Level two miracles are sometimes those death-defying sorts of events that happen in somebody's life. Uh, like, you know, maybe they get into a car accident and uh, they walk away without a scratch. Or um, they, uh, you know, something falls nearby them uh, and uh, had it been just a uh, a split second later or sooner, uh, they could have been harmed very, very seriously. Level three miracles are miracles that break reality. Those are the miracles that you often think about of uh, when people say miracles. These are the miracles like you know somebody walking on water or turning water into wine or raising the dead uh, or uh, you know maybe God healing an amputee. Uh, again, reality is kind of suspended. Any of your experiences with, uh, with the real world would be broken with these sorts of miracles. And so what I want to talk about today uh, has what could almost be thought of as the semblance of a level two miracle, but as you really delve into it and um, examine it, you really start to realize it's a level three miracle. And that miracle uh, is contained in the Book of Mormon. One of the characters in the Book of Mormon is a person by the name of Nephi. He and his family leave Jerusalem uh, around 600 BC because they are warned that it's going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. They flee into the wilderness of the Arabian Peninsula. And there they wander for about eight years. Eventually they come to the, to the coast of the Arabian Peninsula and they are commanded to build a ship. Now, this might not seem so uh, out, outside of the realm of reality because human beings have built ships for literally thousands of years. Um, obviously, somebody's done it, uh, and people have done it all the time in various different places. But it's in the details where all of uh, where everything gets kind of kind of gets kind of wonky. It gets wonky because as Nephi and his family are wandering in the wilderness. They're there for about a decade. Now just think about uh, 
if you are living out um, in the wilderness, you know, camping, you have tents, you have uh, a bunch of supplies that you have to kind of carry with you everywhere you go, what happens to it? Well, it starts to wear out. It starts to break down. You have tents that start to develop holes that you have to patch. You have shoes that have to be replaced. You have um, various other items that just break and you get, get, left, uh, get left behind as you uh, move along. And so you're not really going to be bringing a lot of uh, heavy things or things that aren't very durable um, or things that you're really not going to be using for, um, uh, for a very long time. Uh, you're going to only take things that are the most useful to you and things that um, are really durable because everything else is just going to break down. Also, uh, as they're wandering the wilderness, they're told to uh, steer clear of any sorts of civilization. In fact, they're instructed not to even make a fire uh, for fear of being discovered by other people. So they're not just going into town to buy supplies or to uh, uh, to buy new materials to replace broken things. And so um, in building a ship, you need things. You need tools. And the story kind of hints at that where uh, upon receiving the instruction to build a ship, Nephi asks to where he should go uh, in order to find ore that he can make tools, ostensibly something like iron ore, so he can start making hammers and uh, saws and awls and all, whatever else you would need uh, to build uh, to build a ship. But in order to uh, dig some of this ore out of the ground and uh, turn it into tools, you also need tools. This starts to be kind of a catch-22. In order to make tools, you need tools to dig out ore from the ground um, and prepare it so you can then start to make tools. But you need tools to make those tools you kind of see where I'm going here. You know, granted, the Iron Age was in full swing, so it's very likely that Nephi would have known about iron and where to find it and things like that. But it is not a trivial matter to extract it from the ground uh, and to melt it and to uh, form it into various tools and other items that you would need in order to build a ship. So let's kind of talk about what it takes to do just that. Well, first off, you have to somehow dig iron-rich rocks out of the dirt or out of, out of other rock. Um, it's not just in big chunks that just lay there. Um, you have to uh, break it up um, and then you have to heat up all of this rock that has uh, iron in it um, to about 500 degrees. So that means you're going to be uh, building fires and burning a lot of stuff because it takes a long time and it takes a lot of heat in order to get up to that temperature. Once you're up to those temperatures, uh, you're going to then somehow break all these uh, iron-filled uh, rocks up into small gravel. Uh, then you're going to take all of that rock and put it into a kiln, which is like a big chimney made out of clay. Um, with that chimney, it allows temperatures to get up to about 1300 degrees. And again, you're burning something, so you have to have trees and uh, some sort of tools to cut down the, all these trees in order to feed the kiln, uh, to, to feed the kiln for all of these hours to get your temperatures up to temperature in order to melt down the iron enough uh, that you have at the end of this process a chunk of iron that's ready to be worked into tools. Okay, so you have this chunk of iron that's ready to be worked into tools. How are you going to do that? You need tools, again, to work this iron into other tools. And in order to work this iron, you're going to not only need to get it up to temperature, you're going to need bellows to help reach those temperatures and to concentrate all the heat to, to where you need it to. Otherwise, uh, things just aren't going to get hot enough. Uh, the story does talk about Nephi building a bellows, so we know that he's doing some sort of metallurgy, ostensibly again with iron, but you also need tanning experience. And, you know, it's possible that they've been tanning hides this whole time where they've been uh, wandering in the wilderness, but again, if they haven't been um, cooking their food, they've been eating it raw, you know, who knows if they've also been tanning hide, which, like smelting iron or making tools, isn't a trivial process. It's a very laborious and time-consuming process. So we've already run into several 
difficulties that Nephi would have to solve. First of all, he's uh, obtaining iron somehow, and he's trying to work that iron. He's having to burn a bunch of iron, so he, that means he's needing to cut down trees. So he needs a large source of wood in order to do that. He's building bellows, so he needs um, to uh, have animal skins, you know, tanned animal skins that can hold up to uh, the punishment that he's going to be putting them through as he builds a bellows and uh, essentially starts uh, this huge industrial process. During this whole time, Nephi is essentially reinventing thousands of years of human technology on the fly with what, maybe a couple dozen people? That's, that's a Herculean task, to say the least. Just somebody to fell a bunch of trees and haul them to wherever you need uh, to burn them in order to feed your kilns is going to be a huge task in itself. And how are you cut, cutting down these trees? I guess you could build stone axes and things like that, but again, that is a lot of effort. That is not a lot of people to do essentially a huge industrial task. There are two main styles of ship that Nephi could be building in this story. The first style of ship, which I think John Larson assumes as he describes uh, the whole process in his Mormon Expressions podcast, is a European style vessel. The second style of ship could possibly be a Polynesian style ship, which doesn't require as much technological advancement, but would still be very difficult to build and was technology used by people a half a world away. So to build a European style ship is a monumental task. You need hammers, you need awls, you need saws, tools that we've already talked about that you would need to cut down trees, but also for shaping wood in the proper shapes uh, that you would need to build a ship. One of the first things a ship needs is a keel, which is essentially the backbone of the ship. And there were entire towns that were dedicated to just building keels for European style ships. This required special types of wood that could hold up to the buffeting and the twisting and uh, all the punishment that the ocean would uh, put it through. Uh, it required technology to uh, heat up and steam the wood so it could be bent in the appropriate shapes. It required manpower in order to wield the tools to do all that kind of stuff. And in putting together a keel, this is a very heavy piece of technology. In order to start building the ship, you're not going to just be uh, building something that's like a dugout canoe or a barge that you just push in necessarily. You're going to be building something uh, that can hold this ship and then once it's ready to push it into the ocean. Something like a dry dock which again is a very complicated piece of maritime technology that doesn't just get invented willy-nilly. On top of building a keel, you have to uh, fashion a bunch of boards to form the hull of your ship. You need rib-like structures that give your ship stability and strength, and then the hull has to go together. So again, you're bending and steaming boards in order to, uh, to build this enormous vessel. Okay, so once you have a hull, a keel, uh, essentially the everything you need for the ship, the story indicates very strongly that this is a sailing vessel. So you're going to need a mast. So a large log essentially that is very strong that can hold up to the uh, to the forces of the wind and then you're gonna have to build a sail. A sail is again a very large piece of something. So fabric, perhaps. So that means if it's built out of fabric, you have sheep or some sort of animals that you can shear. So now somebody is taking care of all of these animals. Hmm. Huh. But they likely didn't bring animals with them because they talked about hunting and, um, and eating their meat raw. They would have to have hundreds of animals in order to be able to shear them to build a, something large enough for a sail. And then you don't just need one sail because as you go along, the sail will break down, you have to patch it, you might need to replace it completely. So whatever effort that it took to create a sail in the first place, multiply, multiply by two or three. Then you need rope, lots and lots and lots of rope. 
I don't know if you've ever seen a sailing ship before, but there is rope everywhere. And you're going to be making this rope out of something, either animal skins or plant fibers or wool. So again, that's talking about uh, having animals or stripping down plants in order to make lots and lots of rope. And this rope has to hold up to a lot of punishment. It's going to be in a maritime environment with salt water spraying on it, stretching it out. So you're not going to just be braiding together uh, material and just hoping that it holds up. It has to do a lot of work for a very long time. Okay, so you do all that. You have a sail. You have tons of rope. You have a ship. Then you need to put provisions on this ship. You're going to need to have a lot of water because there's a lot of people on board. So that means you're going to have to invent something like barrels, which aren't going to be invented for another several hundred years yet. Okay, maybe animal skins or clay pots. You have something that's rocking and back and forth and going to be taking a lot of punishment. A lot of those things probably won't last. They're not very durable. Then you also need some sort of method of preserving food, meats and vegetables and things like that, and also staving off scurvy, uh, the bane of the, maritime, of, the bear, of the maritime world. I don't know if you've ever read the pamphlet called I Pencil. Uh, it's essentially the story of how a pencil is made and essentially making the case that there is no person in the world that could build a pencil on their own. You have to get the metal somewhere, you have to mine it, you have to get the graphite, you have to dig that out of the earth somewhere. You have to harvest and mill the wood. You have to have a source of um, rubber uh, from trees and things like that in order to make the eraser. And that comes from all over the world. The story of Nephi's ship is the story of eye pencil on steroids. In fact, it's on all of the steroids. Now, if it was one or two things that you know was unlikely, okay, maybe that could be there could be a case made that Nephi could have done a couple of these things. The probabilities are something that multiply together. You know, what's the likelihood of this times what's the likelihood of that times what's the likelihood of that? All of a sudden, the possibilities really start to shrink down and becomes very, very unlikely, nigh unto impossible that Nephi could ever have accomplished such a task. Okay. So maybe it wasn't a European style vessel. I already mentioned before a Polynesian style voyaging canoe. If you've seen the movie Moana, you've probably seen some of these canoes. The Polynesians settled the Pacific Islands over 6,000 years ago. They came from Asia, moved down through New Guinea, to Fiji, to Tonga, to Tahiti, to Hawaii, and to New Zealand. And they did that with these voyaging canoes. There's a lot that's not known about them. They were double-hulled craft that were lashed together with these cross pieces that made a very stable surface for, uh, for the transport of people and trade goods all over the Pacific. Because of their double-hulled design, they were very stable, especially in the rough seas of the Pacific. You could have a, a sail on them, and they could very easily navigate the, the waters of the Pacific. A medium-sized voyaging canoe could easily be between 50 and 60 feet long, with enough room to carry a couple dozen people with, uh, with all the supplies they would need, with trade supplies, with livestock, whatever they would need to uh, hop from island to island. With the European style vessel, they were put together with nails. Uh, if you're nailing things together with a, with a nail, every nail that you need, you have to make your own. You're not just going to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and, make a and pick up a bunch of nails. You have to make each one individually. A voyaging canoe, on the other hand, had boards that were put together and they had holes punched in them and they were lashed together and they were sealed with some sort of caulking made out of breadfruit so, they did, so that they didn't leak. And they also had sails made out of matted vegetation. So think of something that's kind of thatched together in a large sail. So maybe that was a type of ship that Nephi and his family built. But again, halfway across the world, with technology that was unknown to Nephi and his family. Again, a t level three miracle where you know you have to suspend uh, reality, okay. But in the realms of reality, I don't think so. There was a person back in the 1940s that had a hypothesis that perhaps Polynesians came from the Americas, South America specifically. 
This man's name was Thor Heyerdahl. He wasn't a member of the church. He didn't have any, uh, any connection with Mormonism at all. But he had the thought that Polynesians came from South America and, and settled the Pacific Islands. In fact, he tried to prove that hypothesis by building a Polynesian-style canoe and setting off from Peru and sailing to French Polynesia. He was able to make that trip in about 100 days. This was the Khan Tiki expedition. And if you get a chance to look it up, it was pretty fascinating. However, like a lot of other things, there's just no evidence that this sort of thing actually happened. There's no archaeological evidence, linguistic evidence, uh, DNA evidence. There's just nothing that backs up Polynesians coming from South America. So, no, the Polynesians weren't Nephites or Lamanites. So as a kid, I loved ships and shipbuilding and understanding everything there was about ships. And as my faith was starting to deconstruct, I was trying desperately to grab on to something that could possibly make Mormonism real. Uh, a lot of things were just kind of crumbling around me, and I was trying to find some way to uh, find something that could land Mormonism and some of its claims in reality. And so one of the things I did was tried to, tried to retrace Nephi's possible journey to the Americas and to see if there was any sort of way that that could salvage my failing faith. Traditionally, whenever people talk about Nephi's voyage, he takes off from the Arabian Peninsula and heads due east across the Indian and Pacific Oceans and lands somewhere in South America. I don't know if you've ever seen a globe or seen how far of a journey this would be, but no, no. Just the amount of provisions alone you would need would be vast. So as I looked at the currents of the Indian Ocean, um, I started thinking, well, maybe Nephi and his family, they went south. Maybe they went south along the east coast of Africa. And again, you wouldn't just be provisioning with enough stuff for the entirety of the journey, you'd actually make a lot of stops along the way, along the coast, to reprovision, to take breaks. Heck, maybe this is where Nephi stopped at the Comoros Islands at a city called Moroni. But as they headed along the coast of Africa, they would never be very far away from land. They could put in any time they needed to. Eventually they would come around the south part of Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, which is notorious for being uh, very rough seas. And in the story, they talk about being driven back for several days uh, because of the light-mindedness of Nephi's brothers and because they were not being righteous. Well, they eventually make their way around the Cape of Good Hope and, again, making frequent stops along the west coast of Africa and eventually making their Atlantic crossing where Africa and South America are at their closest. And then eventually, again, hopping along the coast as they... Uh, make their way to where, wherever they ended up landing. Now in the story, it talks about the Nephites living the law of Moses. So in living the law of Moses, having a certain calendar is very important to recognize certain dates so that they could perform certain sacrifices and perform certain rituals. Well, you would need to be in a certain latitude in order to have recognizable stars, to be able to recognize when certain times of year are changing. So they wouldn't have lived in the Southern Hemisphere because that would have been a totally unfamiliar sky. So they would have been somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, which in my mind's eye had them landing somewhere between Florida uh, to anywhere up to New York or you know, may maybe even making their way up the St. Lawrence River into the New York area, into the Great Lakes, maybe making the, a, a local geography or, or a local model uh, more likely you know, being in Joseph Smith's backyard. But with all that said, just because you can come up with an explanation doesn't make it true. That's probably something apologists need to be reminded of from time to time. Any sort of explanation should have some sort of predictive power. And unfortunately, a lot of apologetics just don't have that predictive power. They might try to explain one or two things, but they don't explain other things, or they don't describe how other things could have happened. They just plug a couple holes, but leave other ones wide open. And it also lays bare a couple of things that are wrong with the Book of Mormon. Namely, that it kind of takes away from accomplishments of Native American people. And even you know, if we think about the Polynesian um, wayfinders, it takes kind of away from their accomplishments. And the accomplishments and history of the indigenous American people should not be taken away from them either. 
which is, I th again, one of the things I think the Book of Mormon takes away from indigenous peoples. And they've already had enough taken away from them. The level of technology that Nephi and his family would have had to develop is immense. They would have had to reinvent, essentially, the entirety of all human technology on the fly with a couple dozen people. And that just doesn't, that just doesn't hold any water. And all of those technologies they would have developed would have been supremely useful as they got to the Americas and wouldn't have just been uh, forgotten by the wayside because working with metals and uh, shipbuilding and all these sorts of things would have been invaluable to wherever they ended up. But tell me what your thoughts are. Is there some sort of likely explanation that could have described why, how, why Nephi could have actually built the ship? Uh, do you agree with my assessment uh, that it was impossible, whether it was a European style or a Polynesian style vessel, that the technologies that would have been invented would have been immense? Um, what are your thoughts? Leave a comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you again next time.